opponents of dharma have always been there regardless of which age we live i've been advised not to say the words sanatan dharma because it will term me as right wing now we see all these photos and videos of bhagwan shiv with charas and whatever else and if someone says ke oh, shiv ji used to smoke so i want to smoke we should ask them shiv ji also consumed poison you are willing to consume poison hmm. a pujari was performing these pujas and havans what changes in that pujari's reality that havan is very interesting lose track of everyone apart from the puja and the agni so if you look at the picture of the divine you will see that form in the fire clearly the same form of devi in the photo is the same form in the fire to truly see bhagwan we need knowledge so this deep philosophy is embedded in the process of puja this answers the age old question that children ask their parents while we're performing pujas why are we doing this and the parents usually say chup karke kar this is the actual answer yeah there is a deep core of sanatan bharat that wants to hear the word sanatan that live it in their heart but are afraid to say it on their lips that's so true <laughs> goosebumps we've had so many spiritualists come on the show and talk about ancient indian culture Very few people have openly spoken about what is referred to as Sanatan Dharm. A lot of people fear speaking about Sanatan Dharm. That was the core of this episode. But if you've seen any of our episodes with Om Dhumatkar, you know what an articulate human he is. He's able to explain extremely complex concepts in the simplest of ways. So if you're someone who enjoys chatter about ancient Indian wisdom, this episode. is also going to be one of your favorites it's om dhamatkar on trs we are back baby <laughs> just <laughs> om dhamatkar in the house is the baby addressed to me or to everyone in general it's to the universe okay. to <laughs> all of uh, what dharma encapsulates very good to be back thank you for having me <laughs> thank you for being back in the studio i think for me while i will extract a lot of information from you because you had a very eventful year um this is just kind of a catch up for me like i didn't talk to you outside <laughs> i didn't talk to you much here so that we can speak on camera uh the things you're forced to do as a podcaster <laughs> i love these public therapy sessions they are the best <laughs> actually you say the therapy sessions they actually satsang i love it satsang yeah what is the word satsang, satsang mean satsang is a combination of two sanskrit words sat means truth sang means company and actually satsang can be the path to liberation as well the great spiritual master adi shankara acharya said satsangatve nissangatvam nissangatve nirmohatvam nirmohatve nishchalatvam nishchala tatve jeevan mukti that in the course of satsang you get out of bad company nissang as a result of getting out of bad company nissang you get out of moha or delusion nirmoha nirmohatve nishchala tatvam as a result of getting out of delusion we are firm in our convictions our spiritual convictions and as a result of being firm in our spiritual convictions nishchala tatvam nishchala tatve jeevan mukti we are liberated in this lifetime itself so satsang is the path to liberation but it's the elimination of bad company that begins this process it no it keep good company bad company falls on itself what does that mean it means that if we want to detach ourselves from the lower one way to do it is by trying to throw everything away getting rid of things but it's difficult because even if i may know that something is bad for me i still have attachment to it i still like it I might have friends who are not right for me. They're not right for this chapter of my life. They're not right for where I want to go. But I still have some great memories with them. I still have some form of attach attachment to them. And if I reject them, then it's hurtful at both ends. It will hurt me. It will hurt them. The right way to do it is to attach to something that is greater, and then the lower attachments fall away on their own. If you think about in our childhood, hey, when we were four or five years old, we all had some toy, some car, some stuffed bunny. that was our favorite thing we could not live without it we used to go for birthday parties also there was one you know half dead little stuffed animal with us but everyone thought it was you know dirty but we loved it it was our best thing what happened at some point at age 8 9 10 you attached to other things and then this thing that was okay for one period of our life but inappropriate for the next period of our life fell away this is the same thing good sangha achieves that now 
देर आर सम रियली ट्रांसेंडेंटल पुरानिक स्टोरीज अबाउट वॉट संग कैन डू बट वील सी हाउ द कॉन्वर्सेशन गोज एंड यू कैन शेयर दैम एट द राइट टाइम आई वंडर वॉट द स्टोरीज आर you want me to go through them now yeah because i think friendship has become a priority for me at this point in life i think for the longest time throughout my late 20s yeah because of just how life went about and what society was telling me i thought romance is the priority and even through the show i've realized that it's actually friendship that's the priority yeah. uh like i probably have three or four close bros in mm-hmm. the world who've been there for donkey's years and uh, i probably value them more than i value even a potential romance that could come into my life because uh you know the romance may come and go you might even get married and divorced but those brothers will stay there so i think friendship is a very important truth even from a bit of a spiritual perspective even from a bit of a sanatani perspective uh i spoke about this to rajesh nandi as well uh the thing is he spoke about how when you die hmm technically your marriage also dies because one of the partners is dying correct uh so even something as pure and ultimate as marriage eventually collapses yes but what stays with you throughout life are your friendships possibly you'll carry that into your next birth as well yeah maybe you'll carry your friendship with your wife from this birth into the next birth as well but friendship trumps romance see the more we evolve spiritually the more important association becomes good company they could be friends they could be partners they could be anything and association sangha company friendships are probably the most ignored aspect of spiritual life see if we are progressing spiritually what do we need we really only need three things shastra sadhana sangha shastra scriptural knowledge study wisdom shastric wisdom can come from anywhere we are now sharing it on youtube shastra sadhana some practice needs to be there to allow that wisdom to take root but what is it that keeps you on the path what keeps you on the path is sangha we need relationships in our life that nurture us we need relationships in our life that calm us when we are going through difficult things we need relationships in our life that soothe us we need relationships in our life that give us the opportunity to serve them when they are going through their challenges and yes a romantic relationship or partner is extremely important and finding the right partner is getting more and more difficult these days but there's no fear certainly not as much fear in friendship as associated with finding a partner mm. you find a friend you never like is this the one <laughs> <laughs> mm. okay cool uh, let's talk about the stories so the stories of sangha oh there are so many so many this one really um there's a story that really touched me that um we i recently studied how to do very specific pujas in that there's the navagraha puja nine planets or nine celestial beings the celestial bodies center of that is surya and then you have chandra shukra and so on so all of the celestial bodies that we recognize shani that everyone is so scared of just we clear Guru. sun moon venus mercury uh, mars saturn mars saturn uh, rahu ketu jupiter yeah so um rahu ketu. sun moon mars venus um saturn jupiter rahu and ketu and there's one more which i'm missing M- mercury mercury ha mercury yes so rahu and ketu are very interesting what are rahu and ketu celestially speaking so uh, celestially speaking they don't have a visible presence which is what makes them very interesting because all of the other entities are entities that are there in the solar system and solar system is now a western phrase but saurya mandal predates the idea of the sun being at the center of the solar system by several thousands of years now in the saurya mandal we have rahu and ketu rahu and ketu were um originally one being that ended up being headless so the head became one being and the body became another being and this incident occurred during the churning of the ocean 
so in vishnu puran there is an episode where auspiciousness everything that is good disappears from creation not just from the earth so both the devas and asuras need something to bring it back and they are facing into their own annihilation so they want the nectar of immortality as the ultimate goal so they go to shri vishnu and say we need to find this nectar of immortality so vishnu says okay i will be i will take the form of a giant tortoise on my back place a mountain on that around that mountain wrap a snake on one side of the snake are the devatas the other side of the snake are asuras and start churning so this kshir sagar which we visualizes the ocean of milk which is sometimes is referred to as the milky way as well as a cosmic celestial wow presence and arrangement um in that the churning starts so on one side the devas are pulling the other side the asuras are pulling so this sort of movement and what ends up happening is from this ocean through the process of churning a number of things start to emerge now what is this bhagwan in the form of kurma the um tortoise is the underlying reality that gives on which everything takes place the mountain is our body the snake is a spiritual possibility kundalini that is yet to rise devas and asuras are the higher and lower tendencies in us that are pulling and that churning that is happening in the ocean is the process of meditation from which things are starting to emerge mm. so the first thing that emerges is poison halal and that poison is so terrible so terrible that it gets into the eyes into the lungs you know nobody can breathe at that time bhagwan shiva comes and he consumes that poison and it is limited to his throat tells us two things one is when we are going through the meditation process the first thing that comes out is our inner poison and most people get distracted at this point because they are like oh i can't believe this is in me i thought i was a good person and all these things i'm trying to do something good i can't do it and they give up but you must know and through these stories we know first thing that comes out is poison and that poison is choking us when we when we experience it what to do with it give it to bhagwan because bhagwan is the only one who can consume it without being consumed by it so offer it when the poison come when the thoughts come when the tendencies come in the seat of meditation give it to bhagwan that is one thing second thing it teaches us is that now we see all these photos and videos of bhagwan shiv with charas and whatever else what a ridiculous image what a ridiculous idea and if someone says ke oh shiv ji used to smoke so i want to smoke we should ask them shiv ji also consumed poison you are willing to consume poison mm. most people will say no so that is part of the episode as things go forward other uh, other things come out dhanvantri the deity of ayurved comes out through this process one of the pre planned questions for me for this episode was about dhanvantari okay we might cool. talk about it <laughs> cool that you bringing it up it's supposed to be in this podcast anyway go on and when dhanvantari comes he is holding a kalash a pot which has the nectar of immortality okay now when that nectar of immortality is uh, brought up suddenly everyone wants it they throw the snake they throw the chari they just rush after so bhagwan vishnu assumes the form of mohini and holds that nectar mohini is one who enchants the entire universe anything that is created is enchanted by mohini so in enchanting everyone mohini ji says to the asuras hey you were going how can you just have this go have a purification bath and then come so they go to have a bath amongst them one person stays back and disguises himself as the devta and when and starts to the devta start to consume that amrit and this person gets one drop and as soon as he gets one drop vishnu realizes that it's not a deva and he sends the chakra cuts the head off 
but that one drop by the time has gone in and that asura head that is removed becomes one of them becomes rahu and the one becomes ketu yeah what does this tell us and what does this have to do with sangha that we are talking about it tells us that a asura can be elevated to the level of a deva and can get immortality how not by not by cheating and getting into the lion but by keeping the company of those evolved beings as a result of being in that company rahu and ketu that was born as an asura has been elevated now one may believe that there are devas asuras head was cut off nectar of immortality but the fundamental idea is this good company can transform our lives we have to only seek it out okay uh whose company were you in for the past one year you had something eventful that happened in your life there's a lot that happened in the last one year um again some small context on what mm-hmm. you are professionally yeah uh for people who are seeing you for the first time we've done two episodes but there might may be audiences who've not seen the old episodes yeah and it's been a moment and the channel has grown so much yeah. so i um work as a managing director at a bank in the uk uh i head up strategy for the uk's largest commercial bank uh it's a lot of fun and um i've lived in the uk for the last 18 years the last few weeks in india have probably been the longest that i've been in india since i was a since i was in my teenage years uh alongside all of that i have been uh, a practitioner of uh, hinduism in its most general sense uh all my life but specifically since i was at university so that process is also now 16 or 17 years old um and it has made a huge almost i would say fundamental contribution to who i am today both in my inner space as well as the work that i do and what i have achieved professionally so to put it in very simple terms i am there i am here professionally because of dharma and as a service of dharma that has made me so one interesting thing that happened this year is that that service of dharma took a outward facing form in the sense that whatever insights that i had from my practice and life experiences i used to absorb in myself and keep to myself and in covid there was a small bhagavad gita group that we started and that group then encouraged me to start putting it on instagram at which point we had a conversation i think in september of last year uh and we had another conversation at the end of last year when i was in mumbai and then off of the back of that we launched a new youtube channel speaking about first the bhagavad gita going in depth exploring it from a very practical perspective how can millennials how can gen z people apply this knowledge in their lives and we found in depth scriptural references to challenges that we have today mm. like anxiety like anger like no fab brahmacharya we made three videos with exact detailed scriptural references from bhagavad gita so the mm-hmm. idea was let's not make this text intimidating let's make it accessible and let's make it as an entry point so people understand if they want to go deeper there are many organizations that can take it, take it deeper mm-hmm. but it's intimidating so we started with bhagavad gita and earlier this year we also started hanuman chalisa so one one chopai of the hanuman chalisa we are explaining in detail and linking it back to the fundamental ideas the foundations of hinduism who is bhagwan who am i what is my relationship with the divine what is the nature of karma how do i evolve how do i manifest how do i overcome the challenges in life so that's been a very very wonderful journey why were you in kerala <laughs> so you've jumped a few months ahead so i've spent the last two and a half months in kerala uh, i've taken a sabbatical from work to be able to do this uh i was at an ashram that is maintained by chinmaya mission I've been associated with the chinmaya mission many years my spiritual journey in one sense 17 years ago started with them and um i they used to run this course to teach you how to become a pandit for 6 months they used to teach you all the pujas all the vidhis in detail now this has been an area of interest for me for pretty much my entire life let's take a small pause how many pujas are there as many as you want there to be so i'll give you a, a basic um, idea there are multiple manifestations of the divine 
that are worshipped in specific ways. Okay. Now, Adi Shankaracharya, who is one of the foundational pillars of Hinduism as we see it today, had um, proposed a path called Shan Mata, where there are six manifestations of the divine that are worshipped as access to the highest. Shiva, Vishnu, Devi, Ganapati, Kumara and Surya. What is Kumara? Kumara is uh, Skanda. Okay. Kartikeya. Kartikeya, exactly. So six. Uh, these are, and of course they have their own manifestation. So each of these deities have their own specific pujas. In addition to these pujas, you have Navagraha pujas that are undertaken for, um, for any auspicious activity. Right? And that includes Rahu and Ketu as we were talking about. In addition to that, you have what are known as Havans or Homas. Now, Havans and Homas are performed again in worship of these deities. And you also have Yagyas, which sometimes are used interchangeably with Havans and Homas, but they are not. They are much more detailed. There's a, there's a very, very uh, deep and rigorous process that goes into performing a yagya that takes multiple days, multiple people, which one person doing a homa can never achieve. Yeah. And so like a havan is a micro yagya. In one respect, yes. Both involve fire and invocation of fire and offerings into the fire. But a yagya can take multiple days. A yagya requires the yajmans to be married. Homer doesn't require the Yajmans to be married. Yajmans? Yajmans are the people who are participating. Who are, yeah, who have sponsored it for lack of a better phrase. Okay. Homer doesn't require for the Yajmans to be married. Yajya requires for them to be married. Homa, you can take the Agni from your Diya. Or you can even, not that people do it that much. Normally you just take it from your Diya and light from there. Yajya to produce Agni, there's a very specific process and instrument that is required. You have to kindle that wood. And create that flame. You cannot just take it from somewhere else. In a proper yagya, the entire yagya shala is burnt at the end of it. The entire yagya shala, the entire venue, in which has bamboos and thatched roofs and everything, and it's huge. It's got multiple spaces. That whole thing is set. All right. And people assume that it, this no longer happens in India because it's so it's so detailed, but it does. Where does it happen? Is there, wherever there is very detailed tantra practice in particular, there this type of yagya takes place. I know of one that took place in Kerala uh, not too long ago. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to visit because I was in London. But my dream is to go once at least to experience okay. that. Um, speaking about tantra practice now, I think even the listeners are actually kind of educated on it <laughs> because of all the Rajashin and the episodes. But basically... When someone does a normal mantra, you're getting some sort of spiritual progress. When yes. you meditate using that mantra, you get deeper spiritual progress. And there are certain mantras which are even more powerful. So is it fair to say that a havan is a much larger bomb of progress and then a yagna, how do you say it? Yagya. Yagya uh, is a, an atom bomb of progress. You can say that. You can say that. And what I will say is these are processes that are worth experiencing rather than understanding it theoretically. Because then what the words that we use just now, they actually become an inner experience. The level of opening that takes place inside is very, very different. So for example, I've been performing pujas for many years now, but I learned how to perform a havan recently. And I'll tell you the experience of performing a havan is very different from the experience of performing a puja. Not that I'm saying it's more advanced. It's just the level of connect and the presence of the divine that is much, much more palpable in a havan than what you experience in a puja. Why? Because we invoke the deity in the fire. Now, the fire is not something that is visualized. The fire exists. The fire is producing a certain amount of heat. The fire is producing a certain amount of light. The fire is creating an immediate reaction in us because we are sitting next to it. We are also sweating. We are also, we achieve that luster of that sweat and, you know, the light of the fire starts to reflect in our face. And inside, the energy of that fire catches root. 
and what takes place inside is very difficult to describe you're seeing the same energy of the fire that causes all these external visual and feeling based changes reaches whatever's inside your mind and heart as well yes and creates changes there almost like it's cooking up your soul in some way the ultimate truth in hinduism is visualized as a flame as light as life giving and this isn't just me making it up in the kathopanishad it is said na tatra suryo bhati na chandra tarakam nema vidyuto bhanti kuto yam agni tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati that i am not able to see the sun the moon the stars none of these lights are visible to me until and unless i have touched that light within and having touched that i am able to see experience know everything so if in hinduism the truth is a flame of knowledge or knowledge is a flame then that flame is burning bright in front of us and we get to experience it in the process of a havan okay um little tangential question haan ji a pujari who is performing these pujas and havans and yagnas regularly mm-hmm. sorry yagyas regularly yeah uh what changes in that pujari's reality so firstly you can say yagya you can say yagnya also because it's sanskrit it's nya so people some say yagya some say yagnya i say yagya just because it's easier to pronounce in english but wow. in sanskrit if you were speaking in hindi i would say yagnya yagnya what changes for the pujari what changes for the pujari is i mean they can achieve the highest reality as a result of these processes if that is their goal sometimes we do the karma we do these pujas we do the havans purely to chal karna hai you might do it as a means to an end you know if i am doing one for you and you are paying me i'll be actually let's do it and then i get paid and then i can do whatever i want to do with that money or it might be that i'm so familiar with it i just do what needs to be done get get done with the process and and move forward but someone who is doing it properly to achieve the right energetic outcome one has to invest a certain amount of our energy into the process and one cannot invest the energy without having a clear idea of why we are doing this and that why needs to be aligned actually with the purpose of the puja i cannot do this puja for say say for example if someone's having a health problem and they ask me to do a puja for them i cannot just say i am getting money for this that's why i'm doing it no for the puja to have an effect i have to connect with solving the health problem for that person so that i am going to solve the health problem but i have to create the energetic preconditions if i don't create that energetic condition and i take the payment and i just do the puja then i am accruing bad karma so anyone with a decent understanding of karma won't do that hmm okay you can continue on your pujari 101 so uh, Ch- chinmay mission used to do this course for um for 6 months it used to be and they had only really done it twice to the best of my knowledge in the last sort of 15 16 years but the teacher is a true master of this and for many years i wanted to do it and i used to keep looking at their website their instagram pages when will they announce then finally at the end of last year i somehow managed to pull the contact details of someone in that ashram and i got in touch with them and said look i live in london i'm very interested in the subject you don't look like you're having a course for some time can i just come and stay at the ashram and i will serve in the ashram but just please teach me and that person said oh by the way we are having a two month course we're not going to do the six month version we'll do it over two months why did you want to do it so the why in me is a really difficult question to answer because it comes from a place that is not in the conscious mind it's not a thought that oh i want to have this plan then i'm going to do this i'm going to do it's just a inner calling to do something and actually my connection through hinduism is through puja we used to have we have still ganesh puja at home every ganesh chaturthi and i am very blessed to be born in a family that has been performing this puja in not in the decades but in the centuries hmm. it's been more than 100 years in mumbai at least and a long time before that 
when our lineage was originally in Goa. So when I was uh, two years old, um, this puja was happening at home and I wanted to participate. I was watching it. And so obviously people held me back because, you know, you can't let a two-year-old in front of lights and lamps and all of that. So I was held back from this puja. And in the afternoon when everyone went to sleep, I decided now is my time to do my own puja. So I took the flowers, put it in the oil, <laughs> took the water, offered it, took the chandan, you know, just threw it everywhere. And I was, and when they woke up, I was just sat in there, surrounded by flowers, with chandan on my head and everything, absolutely delighted in myself. Hmm. And that's when my family realized, my parents realized that next year onwards, this could be puja ke liye hmm. So I was three years old when I started doing Ganesh puja, hmm. and then it reached a point about. Uh, more than six six years ago or something that I started doing it on my own. But what had happened is I had this knowledge of Vedanta, of the scriptures that I had obtained about starting about 16, 17 years ago. And then I had a separate understanding of puja and the process. And I had a certain inner experience from performing those pujas. But those two was, it was difficult to reconcile. I mean, I could have used my own uh, understanding to do that. It's different when you have an authorized master teaching you. This is the process. This is the meaning. This is the experience that it means. It is meant to generate. This is the philosophical understanding that one should have when performing the puja. Like what? For example, in any puja, there are three or four stages of the puja. The first stage is purva purvanga puja. Then you have where you. It's a preparatory stage. Then you have Avahanam, which is the invite of the deity to come, where there's a specific process that the pujari has to undergo, which involves their own chakra. I don't want to use the word awakening because that now means something very different on the internet, but utilization of energy through their chakras wow. to be able to invoke the deity in the vigraha, in the form that we see in front of us. That is the second stage. The third stage is the um, upachar. Upachar can be five, panchopachar, it can be 16, shoda shopachar, or it could be even as many as we want. Upachars are offerings. So you offer the deity flowers, uh, uh, pushpa mala, uh, har, you offer them clothes, vastram, angavastram, you offer them water, you offer them chandan, and so on. So each of these offerings are done. And the final one is uttar puja, which is you know, normally when we have Aarti and uh, Karpur Aarti and Pushpanjali and all of these things. And we thank the deity for coming. So those are the four broad phases of the puja. Now you asked me about the mood in which the puja is done. Now the mood is set in the Purvanga puja itself. There is a part of the process called Atma puja. Atma puja tells us how the pujari, in what inner space the pujari is going to be when performing the puja. And it's different for every puja? No, it's the same. But I'm holding back on giving all the information because some of this has to be practiced to be understood. But I'll give it in brief. Your Atma Puja can also be of great depth. See, each of the stages of the puja can be done in huge amount of detail. You can do a puja in 30 minutes. You can do a puja in 3 hours. You can do a puja in 3 days also if you want. So the Atma Puja step is similar. This can go into as much depth as you want. So there are very specific processes of meditation where you see the presence of the divinity in your heart. But ordinarily, if we are doing Atma Puja, there's a very beautiful mantra that is chanted. Deho Devalaya Prokto Jivo Deva Sanatanaha Kyajed Agnyan Nirmalyam Soham Bhave Na Pujayet Deha, body, Devalaya Prokto is a temple, Devalaya. Who is the deity in the temple? Jiva, the individualized Jiva. Deva is Deva. When? Not now, not while doing the puja, not when they reach realization. Sanatana has always been divine. The inner 
space of the person performing the puja has always been divine so therefore why is how do they perform this puja tyajed agnyan nirmalyam by releasing the waste product of agyan which is ignorance so hum bhavena pujayet so hum you have been doing this so hum meditation for many years so hum is i am that i am the supreme reality with that bhava i undertake the puja so a seasoned practitioner will aim to undertake the puja as a process of connecting their current identity which is you know om ranveer whoever else pujari banker turned pujari they want to connect that they want to almost discard that identity and identify with the supreme it's two very simple examples one is when i'm doing a havan i lose even when i do a havan i always explain what is going to happen at the start of the havan and i tell everyone that this is the process some of what i've already shared there's a purvanga puja and so on i share some details about how we invoke the deity into the fire and i say to them say i'm giving you this information now as we go along i may explain a little but at one point the kriya will take over and i won't explain and what happens in that process is that um the i lose track of the room i lose track of everyone apart from the puja and the agni and one interesting thing happened recently when we did a uh, did a havan for maha ashtami in navratri we did a durga maha havan i said to the people who were there that havan is very interesting because we get to experience the presence of the divine in the agni that when you offer nevedya to a vigraha for example the vigraha consumes that vigraha is in what we normally call a murti but vigraha has its own meaning vishesh graha means the home of the divine a special home for the divine is created in that form so that the divine can reside there and it's energized so when we do vigraha puja and offer nevedya to it food to it the vigraha is consuming that food in its pranic form so we say consume this food look at this food we draw its attention to the food and then we offer it each of the pranas pranaswa panaswa venas when we are doing havan we are actually offering the food into the agni so the deity is directly consuming the food not just its pranic element and i said this i was like the presence of the deity can be seen when you sometimes when you look at the picture of the divine you will see that form in the fire and there was someone they wouldn't believe me and then we did the whole kriya they experienced what had to be experienced and at the end of it when someone whoever there was someone who took pictures uh, you know multiple people were there they all taking pictures there was one picture in which clearly you could see devi in fact it's there on my instagram there's devi is there in a photo and in the middle there's the havan kund and the last remnants of the fire are there you can see clearly that the same form of devi in the photo is the same form in the fire with a khadga with a sword and sat on a lion and so on so these experiences are there that's and i'm sharing this because other people have also experienced it so that is one thing that happens second thing one uh, people say to me that when i'm performing a puja especially when it goes into the more intense stages of it like you know later in the puja my face becomes very stony like it becomes almost expressionless and someone asked me why and this is a person who has watched me do puja for many years and someone who i consider close to me and i had to share to them that your like our experience of who we are loosens the presence of the deity takes over so much that actually we have to work extra hard to hold ourselves together Mm. So when I do Ganesh Puja, for example, Ganesh Chaturthi, the day after, day before, I do it with the idea of communing with Bhagwan in a way where Bhagwan comes, Bhagwan is served, everyone else who comes, they are served, 
but my communion is those two days which powers the remaining 363 days to then come back for two more days of ganesh chaturthi the reason i'm asking you about all these things in so much depth is because not every listener who's listening to this is going to perform poojas with the intensity that you do yeah. but i'm sure that people can gain something for the poojas that they perform at home from this conversation definitely at least from an emotional perspective or a intention perspective yeah. the point of pooja is not to transact with bhagwan people say i'm doing this pooja for this purpose fine we can have an intention we can have a sankalpa we can aim to manifest it but we're not transacting that i will give you 100 coconuts give me give me a house people say i'll give you 100 coconuts give me a house what is the value of a house what is the value of 100 coconuts and bhagwan has provided everything doesn't need coconuts from us mm. doesn't need sweets from us doesn't need gold from us even what bhagwan needs from us is bhava are you willing to give yourself through the puja are you able to recognize the presence of divinity and through that recognition offer that is the purpose of puja see one need not do elaborate pujas if one has the ability to sit for pujas has the desire has the love for it is able to take that level of energy please do it but not everyone else can do it so the basic puja is panchopacharam five upacharas five offerings okay but those five offerings which are water uh chandan flowers dhoopa and deepa light these five offerings have deep metaphysical truths in it and when we offer we are offering not just the object but the meaning behind it so the five uh, offerings pancha panchopachar represent pancha mahabhut the five elements and we offer those five elements and we recognize that those five elements have come from the divine and are merging back so there's the there's an independent divine presence from which five elements arise this entire world comes we offer those back and then the entire creation merges into that divine so when we offer water jalam so five one of the five elements earth is represented by gandham by chandan by sandalwood so when we offer the offer chandan we say that we will work in such a way we hum ghis jayenge we might get eroded but we will spread our fragrance and the divinity and the greatness of the divine around us that people will benefit so that with that bhava we offer chandan which represents the earth pushpam flowers represent space akash how because they uh space is unmanifest for a period of time becomes manifest and then changes form again in the same way the flower is a bud for a period of time becomes a flower then gets pollinated and becomes a fruit so that process with that bhava of saying something is there it's not there tomorrow it will come back the day after with that entire cycle is sustained by the divine hour for flowers then you have dhupa dhupa represents the vayu vayu is the um, wind element dhupa is like agarbatti dhupa is agarbatti yeah, you get agarbatti there's uh, dhupa agarbatti very interesting is a type of originally it was called agaru is a type of wood that used to be burnt and used to get used to get fragrance from it that used to be cut into very small splinters so it became it was then called agaru batti and agaru batti now has become agar batti and lot of agar battis you get are made of chemicals and all that but that's a separate discussion anyway naturally fragrant things that occur in nature that are naturally fragrant when burnt we offer to the divine see that this represents vayu and the idea is again that we will live our lives in such a way that we may get rid of ourselves and our ego it completely disappears into ash but the process of doing that will benefit others and finally we have agni which we know as knowledge so that agni we take in the form of aarti and show and use it to see the divine and again it's the same principle tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam knowing with this knowledge only i am able to see the divine and so it's not just so that but you know we offer it and nazar hota that's an element of it we energize it that's an element of it but it is also to truly see bhagwan 
we need knowledge so this deep philosophy is embedded in the process of puja and simply five offerings can help us live that okay this answers the age old question that children ask their parents <laughs> in india why we performing pujas why are we doing this and the parents usually say chup kar ke kar <laughs> this is the actual answer yeah and you know i i used to have that with my parents as well and for one time i sort of resented these answers i said why aren't you telling you know why don't you know if you don't know then you can't tell why and i realized one thing there was no podcast back then yes <laughs> <laughs> that's the actual See, truth what happened our grandparents generation fought for the independence of bharat mm they had to do what they had to do to gain freedom for us our parents generation fought to be independent in bharat they were focused on survival through this entire license raj and where every every person that stood out was hammered back in the mm. nail that stands out should be hammered back in that was the idea in their generation they could not focus on anything but survival we are the first generation of bharatiyas in hundreds of years who have the opportunity not just to survive but to thrive goosebumps that's and, so true that's... and our culture our sanatan sanskriti that is timeless i won't even say thousands of years so that is timeless gives us the means to thrive <sighs> okay what is sanatan dharma sanatan dharma i i also want to say uh-huh. before i let you begin is that and i hate saying this online but because of the political climate of our times even the word sanatan dharma is a dangerous word to use on the internet for a mainstream brand like myself and that's so sad i mean i know what sanatan dharma is i'm asking for the sake of the podcast and to obviously increase my knowledge about it but i've literally been advised by media professionals not to say the word sanatan dharma because it'll term me as right wing slummy live guys <laughs> uh the and, opponents of dharma have always been there regardless of which age we live even in satyug there were opponents of dharma even in treta yug when bhagwan shri ram ke there were opponents of dharma in dwapar yug bhagwan shri krishna had to reestablish dharma because people were hell bent on destroying dharma and today in the kali yug you cannot say the word dharma without someone jumping down our neck yeah. and calling us names you know i'm literally told i'll lose brand associations if i say the word sanatan dharma there is a deep core of sanatan bharat that wants to hear the word sanatan and understand it that live it in their heart but are afraid to say it on their lips this conversation and conversations like these is intended to empower those bharatiyas okay uh one caveat i want to just place here is that while we're talking about sanatan dharm uh i hope that it's clear that we're not anti any religion okay because the one thing that i do know about sanatan dharm is that it's extremely subjective based on the the life experiences and the mindset of the practitioner yeah. of sanatan dharm the one thing that i've learned about sanatan dharm for me and of course this might be a trickle down of my own personality into my understanding of sanatan dharm but i believe in universal love yeah. even more than i believe in my land and my own culture if i'm talking about sanatan dharm it doesn't mean that i'm looking down upon islam or christianity or judaism or sikhism or buddhism or jainism or anything like that i was born into a sanatani family i'm just trying to understand my own roots better yeah. with respect for all other faiths and not thinking that my faith is better or worse than any other faith and you know i because i work in banking one of the nice things about banking which i really enjoy i love what i do for work um uh, is that we are very precise in our use of language if something is say if you're talking about growth then we know exactly what is meant by growth there's no distinction between percent and percentage points it's very clear 
this is what it is if we are talking about profit it is exactly clear what it is if we are talking about cost it's exactly clear what it is so the first thing that we need to do in this discussion is define our terms so before we go into the philosophy of it as well sanatan means eternal dharma comes from dharyate iti dharma that which upholds that which allows things to be enables things to be their essential nature is dharma and in sanatan dharma the idea is that the essential nature of everything that is manifest every person every being every situation is divine that there is an underlying divine consciousness that is both soaked through in this manifest creation that we see and also independent from it it's almost like this creation is a projection on the screen that is this reality this reality is called brahman in its unmanifest form uh, so sanatan dharma sanatan has its meaning which is eternal timeless dharma dharyate iti dharma and religion comes from the latin word which means to reconnect so sometimes when we use words in english they lose their essential meaning mm. yeah so say for example if we take the manifestation of religion today non dharmic religions okay which in which are born outside of india have a similar structure obviously they have great depth of their own they've got their own um approaches towards the inner space and so on but there's a broad structure that is relatively um uh, replicable in some ways which is that there's a prophet there is a book or uh, there is a series of sort of directives and there is a theology around that around the meaning of life who is the divine how to connect with the divine what are the meditative processes so there are relatively bounded elements okay sanatan dharma is not like that sanatan dharma is i visualize sanatan dharma is like a mother with open arms that embraces her children in all of their manifestations so in sanatan dharma we have multiple different theologies and not only do they coexist but they recognize the validity of others what does that mean within hinduism we have a theology that is called vaishnavism which says vishnu is supreme within that we will have people who say krishna is supreme within that we will see people who have ram is supreme then you have another separate one shaivism shiva is supreme you have a separate one which is shaktism shaktapath says devi is supreme but they are not sitting here at war with each other why because all of those multiple different theologies not the best word in the world because it's got its own connotations but we are speaking english so we Limit, use it limitations of the english language exactly all of these different theologies are connected by the vedas and a wider body of hindu scripture that includes the upanishads puranas and uh, itihasas and all of these different theologies theologies will buy into those and as a result they are nourished by it and because this is a dharma of principles not a religion of rules those principles have been reestablished over and over again based on the time and period in the treta yug we needed a rama to come in the dwapar yug we needed a shri krishna to come each our religion survives and remains connected to its foundational vedic principles because we have the ability to regenerate otherwise what attacks hindu dharma sanatan dharma has faced how much has been destroyed you know i said shaivism vaishnavism ganapatya shakti part this saurya part see surya is the supreme 
that what is left of that now is chhat puja that happens in bihar and uttar pradesh and right. that part of the country but and there used to be great surya temples konark in orissa modera in gujarat martand in kashmir but lost over time there is of course the surya worship uh, i've also learned the puja when i was in kerala you know you said the phrase so much has been destroyed the phrase that drops into my head the moment i hear that is so much will be rebuilt i think in our lifetimes i think by people like us our generation of sanatanis not to feed my own ego or your ego or our ego through this i just feel it's sanatani duty almost to rebuild things like we when we serve dharma dharma nourishes us dharma protects us people ask me oh you know you're doing dharma raksha said me i don't have the ability to stand in front of dharma and say i am a rakshak i am doing dharma seva yeah and through dharma seva dharma is protecting me and we should understand why we should do dharma seva we should not do dharma seva because you just because we are born into a certain um into a certain framework we should do dharma seva because dharma addresses the essential questions of life why are we here how do we have relationships how do we navigate the challenges that come through how do i deal with anxiety how do i keep focused on my goal how do i deal with heartbreak all of these things are addressed by dharma and at each level in addressing it it lifts our perspective dharma is something that is not just spoken in the peace of this podcast studio it is not just spoken of in the quietude of the himalayas in the serenity of an ashram in the forest no dharma is something that serves us even on the battlefield of kurukshetra where horses are neighing elephants are trumpeting conches are blowing swords are rattling in the middle of all of that arjuna can completely break down and surrender to bhagwan and bhagwan will deliver the message of dharma that dharma will serve him not just in that battle but continues to serve us in the battles of our lives 5000 years later yeah you know i've had a blessed experience doing this show in general this episode included but i've had palgar in pochu spoke about buddhist thought i've not had a jain monk yet the intention is to have jain monk but i've discussed jainism with some of my jain friends i've had some sikhi experts mm-hmm. these are all indic religions they originated out of our land i personally feel in so many ways they all connected to each other so deeply of course currently there are political differences etc uh, the masses often look at it as you versus me i'm not saying all of the masses but section of the masses want to fight more than they want to build bridges uh, but in truth the indic religions are all deeply connected to each other yeah. there's deep brotherhood there is a great jain master by the name of shri rakesh bhai zaveri who is based in mumbai he he's he speaks in gujarati uh, in his pravachans obviously he can speak english and he's a very erudite speaker in english as well but his pravachans on the bhagavad gita on narada bhakti sutra on ashtavakra gita on bhaja govindam have helped me understand hindu texts deeply and actually i i used to listen to his talks on narad bhakti sutra for example then i used to go and read my guru swami chinmayananda's commentary and they were the same mm. yeah so yes there is there are doctrinal differences i'll give you one example this bell that we have here this is a buddhist bell right it's a tibetan buddhist bell and what what is a distinguishing feature of this bell is that there is a space over here in the middle right there are spaces over here this represents shunyata absence in hinduism we will even though it's a beautifully created bell and it has a lovely sound we would not use this for puja why because we don't believe in shunyata that shunyata we see as purnata that where there is nothing there is the possibility of everything now very narrow very narrow spiritual difference but an important spiritual difference right 
does that stop us having this over here does that stop us appreciating its beauty does that stop us having a meditative experience when whoever gifted this to i think it's palga rinpoche yeah. when he uses it in his worship no we see that beauty and one of the things that all spiritualists must bear in mind is that the goal of our spirituality is to overcome our ego not to create a new ego that i am a spiritual person and it's a very sharp razor's edge to walk because the moment we start to say i am spiritual we are in danger of losing ourselves mm. and i'll tell you this from personal experience i there was a period of 3 or 4 days after a long period of meditation where i came out i came out of that period of meditation came back to mumbai uh, okay came back into the city environment and i for whatever reason i started using the phrase i am a creator with regards to the work that i do on youtube the seva that i do on youtube and immediately my entire focus just it was like someone pulled the plug and everything just drained out why because i used to always use the phrase i am a seeker the point of doing this is to seek and to continue seeking i am not even a i wouldn't even say i am a teacher definitely not a creator i am a seeker and i am seeking in public and all of us as spiritualists must bear in mind and really walk this path so that we don't create a new spiritual ego because that we will get so close to the finish line and hold ourselves back from crossing it okay i want to go back to that question i was asking about the chakras and the planes i was actually Ji. getting to another question Haan but Ji. the chakras and the planes thing was just a small yeah. context so so nyaya <laughs> so we called all of the schools of philosophy of those schools of philosophy yoga is where chakras are mostly dealt with okay okay uh the question i was going for was actually about those planes Haan of Ji. existence yeah which i believe i've spoken to gauranga das prabhu yeah. about as well and each of those planes is governed by a different deity haan ji like the plane from which you get your root chakra is governed by ganpati yeah uh and then i don't remember the exact yeah, yeah. allocation of different deities but each chakra is governed by a different deity yeah okay the reason i'm even bringing this up one is that it's a cool kind of thing uh, to bring up the second reason is um through rajashi nandi and through all the tantra conversations i've realized how alive the deities are yeah how they have their own thought i would go as far as saying intention or wishes mm-hmm. uh they have their own sense of consciousness okay so my question is take all these deities ganpati vishnu shiva kartikeya you name it they all definitely conscious of the fact that all these sanatani people in this landmass that we call india are currently waking up to sanatan dharma again but the thing is we are possibly waking up to it because of our life experiences you were born in the family you were born i was born in the family i am born you had childhood experiences i have had childhood experiences now at age 35 and 30 we are together discussing our own experiences yes. but those experiences were also put into our life by the deities that's yes. why we are who we are yeah so parallelly with india rising as an economy i know that the deities have had a role to play there as well yeah right because as bhagwan says not even a leaf that falls is without my, my intention so, so everything that's happening in our material plane right now is happening because something else is happening on all those spiritual planes yeah have you ever wondered about what these deities are thinking about where india is right now now deities are not just multiple independent beings that are looking down on us there are some philosophical schools that believe that but what i have studied as an advaitin advaitic vedantin is that the truth is one in fact not only is the truth one the truth alone is that manifests as everything so various and that truth is known as brahman that brahman resides in all of our hearts and gives us life and in, in our hearts it is known as paramatma and based on our requirements our temperament our tendencies manifests as a personal form of divinity that is known as bhagavan 
सो वॉट ब्रह्मन मैनिफेस्टिंग फॉर मी एज गणेशा मे मैनिफेस्ट फॉर यू एज श्री कृष्णा दैट डजेंट मीन दैट श्री कृष्ण एंड गणेशा आर डिफरेंट आर सेपरेट सो देर इज अ डिवाइन प्ले एट वर्क दैट इज ऑलवेज ब्रिंगिंग डिसऑर्डर टू ऑर्डर दैट इज ऑलवेज ब्रिंगिंग अज्ञानता टू ज्ञान and sometimes that is done through the process of enlightenment sometimes that is done through the process of danda punishment and these cycles continue so we are now in a process i feel of great change and we can see it in our life experiences in the world around us there's so much that is changing in a matter of months that would have taken decades to change in previous ages so as that change continues there is divine energy that powers it those who are able to tap into that divine energy then are potentially the drivers of the change but equally there is an energy that takes us towards chaos that and there are a lot of people who prefer chaos to order who benefit from chaos there are players in financial markets that like crashes because they make money when crashes occur and so this has always been a a game from okay. satyug till now okay um for the sake of understanding better i'm going to reference a historical character uh uh-huh. i'm going to talk about duryodhan ji if duryodhan was an actual human which i believe he was yes if the deities were creating the path for the pandavas yeah specifically shri krishna ji if he was guiding the pandavas what higher energy was duryodhan being guided by and another way of asking this question is so say for trs mm-hmm. when i'm trying to grow it yeah i know the message and the intention i'm trying to put out yeah i'm trying to popularize sanatani thought in many ways because i feel generations of indians before me were not able to yeah even if they wanted to now i have technology i will amplify sanatani philosophy yes because it's helped me yeah i also face opposition yeah i'm not asking you about the opposition i'm asking about the energy that is making the opposition become my opposition yeah we'll we'll do it i'll answer it in two halves we'll do the duryodhan example specifically because this question comes up a lot that's a really good question then we'll talk about trs and where we are right now i've also spoken about this earlier on the show this is what a lot of people call satan satan or yeah. evil in the world yeah. that where there is light there is also darkness yeah. and where light is trying to grow darkness will try to pull it down yeah and the sanskrit word for that or the phrase for that is shreyans karmat vigna bahuda so there are many barriers vignas in good work okay now if you look at duryodhan duryodhan and arjun at their core were enlivened by the same divine principle paramatma they were the same divinity resided in duryodhan as it did in arjun but duryodhan was a collection of karma that had come down to him as his prarabdha and were reinforced by the choices that he made in life that took him down that path the divinity divine bhagwan deities nobody guided him to that path in fact what facilities arjun had same facilities duryodhan also had they had the same guru dronacharya they had the same bhishma pitamaha same bhishma pitamaha was an enlightened master he gave us vishnu sahasranam so the same access same access to bhagwan shri krishna parshuram was also there in bharat at that time and they also had good relationships with um balabhadra um and so in the same circumstances two people end up in two different ways why because of their choices and because people of influence make poor choices that have have multiplied impacts on society the divine needs to manifest and set that right not just duryodhan the same thing happened with ravan same thing happened 
n number of times with dash avatar so and there are other avatars of other deities also that have ended up performing the same purpose uh, fulfilling the same purpose so the core is divine but what causes people to act that way is not the deity is trying to engineer it like puppet masters mm. but the choices that those beings are making now if you come to the current scenario we have not just been born in this age we have been born multiple times in previous ages in different genders in different countries in different cultures but what has got us to this point is some desire in our hearts as you say to spread the message of sanatan and spread why to spread the sanatan message why because it serves humanity not because i am flogging a certain brand of philosophy yeah because truly it has uplifted me it has uplifted everyone i have seen around and is there's evidence to say that it has uplifted generations of people before so that desire has always been there it has grown in our heart and today that desire has fructified into a mechanism that allows us to fulfill that purpose and if you see the most enduring work is those who act without ego some of the most enduring work in humanity was created when there were no podcasts there was no communication christ for example was nailed to the cross and on that cross he was able to say forgive them lord for they know not what they do do you think he was identified with that body that was nailed and because of that lack of identification his thought process continues for thousands of years krishna when he gave the bhagavad gita did not sign it off made by krishna it was given fully identified with the divine not with this physical manifestation at all and that message of the bhagavad gita resonates till today not just the message but even the activities and so if you look at the journey of just of trs of your specific journey been doing it for 8 9 years now 9 years later yeah yes there are many ways you are the same person but in many fundamental ways you are no longer that the man that started this journey and because you have been willing to let go of that version of you that no longer serves your purpose in life not only have you been able to grow inside but you have been able to grow outside and not only have you been able to grow outside but you've been able to give other people space and a platform for their own personal growth what is the enemy in this process the enemy is ego and it's a very hard thing to try and understand because we live in a world and our brains are constructed in such a way that we need to see opposites we need to see x versus y mm. but if you see if you go into depth into some of our scriptures you realize that what covered someone's access to the divine was not that someone was an entirely black uh, entirely uh, dark minded evil person but that they had allowed their own inner divinity to be shrouded by their ego if you take the example now we spoke about duryodhan and arjun having the same access another example is ram and ravan now i am not one of these people who says that ravan was a you know a, a good person that has been misunderstood no 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 ravan is the anti hero of the story but it's not as if ravan was wholly evil in the way that we have been accustomed to hearing in the english language or in that sort of thought that we inherited from um years of colonization but we have to recognize that ravan was an accomplished sadhaka he had achieved lots of siddhis with his sadhana he had uh, achieved darshan of his divine lord imagine we are not in that place where we can do that he had achieved a lot he had done years and years and years eons of penance to achieve some of the strength that he had but what was his downfall his downfall was his ego 
and when we say ego it, in its english word context it comes up comes up as pride yes pride is part of it that's abhiman but in sanskrit the word itself gives us the meaning ahankar is the word for ego it means what aham karta i am the doer mm. the idea that everything that is even my sadhana has been achieved by me not because of the grace of the divine you know this food that i have had has been acha you sowed the seeds you waited 6 months for it to sprout you collected it you cleaned it you cooked it no it's come to you clothes have been bought by me acha you harvested the cotton you were the one who created it into cloth you were the one who stitched it packed it no you not even probably not even the one who washed it so this idea that aham karta this whole creation has been created by me is what leads to someone's downfall now how do we get rid of ahankar one very simple way and i don't even say this is a starting point because many accomplished uh meditators and sadhakas are also benefit by this is to listen to kathas because then we get inspiration not just on how great bhagwan is but also the journey as seekers the start of this conversation we spoke about how the process of meditation gives us a uh, poison it releases the poison and what but we also learned what to do with it that is where that is in the katha we learned how good sangha can be transformative and take us from a demonic state to a divine state where is that that is in the katha now in diwali there is one of the days is called narakasur naraka chaturdashi where narakasur was um killed by bhagwan shri krishna and satya bhama now naraka was was the child not of asuras he was a child of bhagwan shri vishnu and bhudevi when vishnu was in a varaha roop he had or he conceived with bhudevi this child it was called naraka naraka despite his divine parentage hung out with asuras banasur and mura and as a result of that from divine went to dana hmm at the moment of his killing and there's a whole story around what happened why and this that at the moment of his death at the hands of bhagwan shri krishna he looked at bhagwan and realized that this is the supreme divinity and i'm not going to say all of his sins got washed away no he had to pay but what he said is may this day of my death be the day that people not only light lamps but burst crackers so that they are woken up from their complacency that there is a divine principle at play and that divine principle can consume us at any time so let us live a life in recognition of that that is why we burst crackers not because someone has like maja aa gaya chalo phatake lagate hain there is a divine principle behind this and kathas teach us so there is an element of inner cleansing that happens through listening to kathas that will lead us to lose an association with the ego once that happens there are many processes okay um do you pray to deities other than ganpati yes why if ganpati is your ish uh because ganpati tells me to pray to them <laughs> simple answer but i'll go i'll go a little bit deep i it's not that simplistic see um we believe that we are choosing whom we pray to mm but we are not the divine comes into our life in many forms and draws out the love that we have why because they want us to understand something specific but the philosophical element of my, sometimes when this happens you get a little bit confused because you'll be like oh but i used to pray to ganesha now i am praying to devi or i am praying to krishna is that mean i'm being disloyal to ganesha that's where philosophy comes in and in the rigveda it is said ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti the truth is one 
the wise call it by different names this is what this is brahman brahman manifesting for my needs what karuna what compassion that bhagwan has taken not just one but multiple forms in my lifetime to keep my connection with the divine and draw me towards them so not just my attitude when i am praying but any advaitin any advaita vedanta practitioner who is worshiping the divine will worship it with that bhava but then what's the difference in the outcomes of those prayers see there are many uh okay i'll give you a puranic example and then i'll talk about the principle in durga puja we celebrate the destruction of mahishasur by devi by ma durga that mahishasur represents all the lower tendencies in us but if you read the durga saptashati in order for ma to defeat this mahishasur she needed all of the divine astras of all of the deities she needed the chakra of vishnu bhagwan she needed the veil of kumara she needed the trishul of bhagwan shiv she needed pasha and ankush from ganesh ji all of these as she needed vajra from indra to defeat this so in the same way if we have a divinity that is inside us or that is enlivening us that is our essential core nature to overcome this darkness of ignorance we need all of these different say astras but really their capabilities hmm abilities and different deities are able to bestow them on us now you can go all the way through worship of one deity as well that's no nothing stopping you a uh, heart purified by the worship of krishna will perceive the divine reality no doubt but some of us all of us really uh, have had layers and layers of ignorance so each layer needs to be wiped off mm. the only question is in this lifetime is it one layer with one deity or multiple layers with multiple deities hmm kind of a simplistic question okay sometimes i think after a certain point if your perception has increased to a certain degree please tell me if this happens to you or even if it doesn't yeah if you meet someone you can kind of tell which deity they are worshiping without them mentioning it because certain characteristics show up in the way they speak perhaps in the way they look uh again this is not for everyone this is not a conversation which everyone even understands there's a lot of people listening to this yeah. and thinking that this is woo woo yeah but people who have practiced sadhana yeah know exactly what i'm saying yeah so if you are familiar with the characteristics of that deity that is being worshiped yes so say for example i have a f- um if i worship uh shri ganesh okay and i haven't really ever worshiped narasimha ji then if someone is worshiping narasimha ji i may not be able to recognize it but if i have worshiped narasimha ji or i am familiar with what is the energy that narsimha ji narsimha dev brings into the room then you are able to recognize or at least you are when they say okay, this is my ishta you are able to see it and you are right you are able to see it in the appearance as well like all the iskon monks we've had on the show bring this bliss freshness all my shiva bhakt friends bring a certain level of isolation and detachment uh-huh. uh and all the devi worshipers i know are either extremely active like in the head in the thoughts or uh they are very they have this nurturing energy about yeah. and uh, the nature of our personality bhagwan draws us based on what equipments that we have got or that we need at that stage and that we need at that stage and then they get amplified through the process of sincere worship okay Okay, I think that's about the end of the episode. <laughs> Is there any topic you want to talk about? I I just wanted to I mean, it was a reflection, not that I've come in with an sure. agenda to talk about this. We spoke about Bharata and um and uh you know, drawing into uh Sanatani culture to be able to nourish our mindsets and go into the future. I just want to leave people with one thought around that. and this thought has emerged from many coaching sessions that i do 
one of the things that happened this year is that people started to reach out to me for coaching and i think very very few people a handful of people they tend to be senior executives uh for a variety of reasons including the fact that coaching these people will be able to get them uh, will be able to have a multiplier effect into society but coaching these very very wealthy people uh, and very very successful people it's not me one thing many of them are lacking a definition of what success is so you have these highly successful people thinking and experiencing themselves as failures and one of the things that we do in the process is to reorient themselves and see themselves both as a success that they are but also then being able to maximize their potential and being able to know when is enough so these are the three things now why am i mentioning this because obviously i am one person we cannot coach everyone not everyone wants coaching but if everyone is able to take this idea and define for themselves or at least invest in understanding what success is what success feels like intrinsically to them then we will have a society that is satisfied and not chasing mm. and as a result of that satisfaction they will feel abundant and give more if i am constantly chasing then even if i have a lot i want more because i am trying to fill a bottomless pit but if i am satisfied in myself i feel successful i feel happy i am able to give more and the more we can orient ourselves from a society that chases consumes and hoards which historically we have not been but the world itself is right now the less we can go down on the trap and more we can move towards a sense of abundance and giving the greater the probability is that bharat will become the vishwa guru that we all wanted to be okay om dhamatkar <laughs> the guru of the podcasting world the seeker the Please. seeker of the podcasting world thank you for another catch up uh, hope to see you soon hope to learn from you again and hope to see more of what that sponge brain of yours has accumulated when it comes to dharma <laughs> wonderful being here thank you so much for giving me the opportunity for this satsang and i really look forward to our next catch up thank you thank you bro see you soon see you that was the episode ladies and gentlemen om bhai also runs his own youtube channel and i will definitely urge you guys to go subscribe to his youtube channel as well he's been a mentor to me he's been a spiritual guide in so many ways and there's so much more about him that i know because i'm an offline friend of his i've known him way before i even conceptualized beer biceps i urge you to go see the other episodes we've done with om bhai if you haven't already we're going to be back soon with some deep spiritual episodes just like this one so keep supporting trs and until next time guys we'll see you very soon